Modern Money by L. Randall Ray Policy Implications Deriving from This View of Money The chartalist or state money view has important policy implications. Once the state imposes a tax on its citizens, payable in a money it creates, it does not need the public's money in order to spend. Rather, the public needs the government's money in order to pay taxes. This means that the government can buy whatever is for sale in terms of its money merely by providing its money. Because the public will normally wish to hold some extra money, the government will normally have to spend more than it taxes. In other words, the normal requirement is for a government deficit. Nor are deficits to be feared. As Lerner argued, the implication is that all the conventional wisdom about government finance is confused and must be replaced with a functional finance approach. According to Lerner, quote, the central idea is that the government fiscal policy, its spending and taxing, its borrowing and repayment of loans, its issue of new money, and its withdrawal of money, shall all be undertaken with an eye only to the results of these actions on the economy, and not to any established traditional doctrine about what is sound or unsound. End quote. Lerner, 1943. He went on to list two laws of, func of functional finance. Quote, the first re financial responsibility of the government, since nobody else can undertake that responsibility, is to keep the total rate of spending in the country on goods and services neither greater nor less than that rate which, which at the current prices would buy all the goods that it is possible to produce. End quote. When spending is too high, the government is to reduce spending and raise taxes. When spending is too low, the government should increase spending and lower taxes. Quote, An interesting corollary is that taxing is never to be undertaken merely because the government needs to make money payments. Taxation should therefore be imposed only when it is desirable that the taxpayers shall have less money to spend. End quote. If the government is not to use taxes to make money payments, then how are these to be made? According to Lerner, the government should not turn to borrowing for the purposes of spending because, quote, the second law of functional finance is that the government should borrow money only if it is desirable that the public should have less money and more government bonds, end quote. In other words, the purpose of taxes and bonds is not really to finance spending, as each serves a different purpose. Taxes remove excessive private income, while bonds offer an interest-earning alternative to money. Instead, the government should meet its needs by printing new money. Whenever the first and second principles of functional finance dictate that neither taxes nor bond sales are required. Government deficits do not require borrowing by the government, bond sales. Rather, the government provides bonds to allow the public to hold interest-bearing alternatives to non-interest-bearing government money. In summary, Lerner argued, quote, Functional finance rejects completely the traditional doctrines of sound finance and the principle of trying to balance the budget over a solar year or any other arbitrary period. In their place, it, pres it, pre it prescribes, first, the adjustment of total spending by everybody in the economy, including the government, in order to eliminate both unemployment and inflation using government spending when total spending is too low and taxation when total spending is too high. Second, the adjustment of public holdings of money and of government bonds by government borrowing or debt repayment in order to achieve the rate of interest which results in the most desirable level of investment. And third, the printing, 
hoarding or destruction of money as needed for carrying out the first two parts of the program. End quote. In this view, then, the supply of government money, or base money, is determined by government purchases, including goods, services, and assets purchased by the Treasury and the Central Bank. Much of this currency and reserves will then be removed from circulation as taxes are paid. The rest ends up in desired hoards, or flows to banks to be accumulated as bank reserves. Thus, fiscal policy determines the quantity of base money supplied. Monetary policy then drains excess reserves, mainly as a result of government bond sales by the Treasury, but also through open market sales by the central bank. Removing them from member bank accounts and replacing them with bonds voluntarily purchased to earn interest. As Boulding, 1950, had argued, fiscal policy has more to do with the quantity of money issued by the government, while monetary policy has to do with regulation of financial markets, most importantly with determination of short-term interest rates. Once monetary policy has set an overnight interest rate, Fed funds rate in the U.S. or bank rate in the U.K., target, it has no choice but to supply reserves when banks are short, or to drain reserves when banks have excess reserve positions, for otherwise deficient reserves would drive the overnight rate up and excess reserves would drive it down. In either case, forcing the central bank to miss its targets. In other words, reserves are not discretionary from the point of view of monetary policy. The central bank must always accommodate, and neither is the supply of privately issued money. The only policy instrument available to the central bank is the short-term interest rate. Keynes said that the two outstanding features of the monetary economy are its tended tendency to generate an arbitrary and inequitable distribution of income and its failures to provide for full employment. Footnote 18. Again, see Chapter 24 of Keynes's General Theory. End footnote. In large part, the arbitrary and inequitable distribution of income result from an interest rate that tends to be too high. Keynes argued that interest rewards no genuine sacrifice, and compounding ensures that the distribution will go to the rentier. He linked unemployment to the desirable he linked unemployment to the desire for liquidity. Only monetary economies have unemployment. By definition, Whatever is technically feasible in a non-monetary economy can be done. If the pharaoh observes there are some idle men about, he puts them to work to build a pyramid. Financing can never get in the way of pyramid building. Although insufficient quantities of real resources or lack of technical know-how can act as real barriers. It is only the modern economy that appears to be financially unable to do what is technically possible. The U.S. and Japan and Germany are supposed to have to suffer unemployment because they are all too poor to put the unemployed to work because their governments are broke. They simply do not have the money to employ those without jobs. As the state or charterist approach to money demonstrates, this is nonsense. Governments issue money to buy what they need. They tax to generate a demand for that money, and then they accept the money in payment of the tax. If a deficit results, that simply indicates the population wishes to hoard some of the money. The deficit is of no consequence to the government. It merely allows the population to save in the form of government money. If the government wants to, it can let the population trade the money for interest-earning government bonds, but the government never needs to borrow its own money from the public. Taxes and bonds, therefore, have nothing to do with financing a government spending, and, indeed, 
are after the fact as they necessarily follow spending rather than precede it. Footnote 19. C. Ray, 1998. End footnote. This does not mean that the deficit cannot be too big, that is, inflationary. It can also be too small, that is, deflationary. At the end of the 20th century, most of the developed capitalist countries have deficits that are so small that there is real danger of a massive worldwide deflationary spiral. There are tens of millions of people who need jobs. By some accounts, there are more idle workers now than there were at the depths of the Great Depression. In a monetary economy, unemployment is de facto evidence that the deficit is too small. Any modern economy can hire all those unemployed at some announced fixed wage, letting the deficit float as high as necessary without worrying about inflation, since by setting the wage the government sets the price. In a very real sense, those employed in such a program become a labor buffer stock, which will serve as a price-stabilizing reserve army of the employed. I have called this the employer of last resort program, and it is very similar to that to what Wendell Gordon, Bill Mitchell, Hyman Minsky, and Philip Harvey have all independently advocated in recent years. Footnote 20. See especially Gordon, 1997, and Ray, 1997. End footnote. Sweden used to have something like this, and interestingly, justified its full employment program on the argument that Sweden was too small and too poor to afford unemployment. Thus, it needed to have everyone working in order to compete. This, it seems to me, has got the, has got the thing the right way around. No economy that operates on the basis of a chartal money needs to accept unemployment either because it cannot afford to give jobs to the unemployed, or because full employment would be too inflationary. Full employment can always be afforded. Indeed, any rational analysis would argue that unemployment cannot be afforded. And if is achieved through something like an employer of last resort program, it will actually be less inflationary than the current system which relies on unemployment and waste of resources to reduce inflation pressures. Again, any rational analysis would conclude that a system that wastes resources must be more inflationary than a system which puts resources to work. As Keynes argued three quarters of a century ago, on the precipice of the Great Depression, quote, the conservative belief that there is some law of nature which prevents men from being employed, that it is rash to employ men, and that it is financially sound to maintain a tenth of the population in idleness for an indefinite, for an indefinite period, is crazily improbable. The sort of thing which no man could believe who had not had his head fuddled with nonsense for years and years. Our main task, therefore, will be to confirm the reader's instinct that what seems sensible is sensible, and what seems nonsense is nonsense. We shall try to show him that the conclusion that if new forms of employment are offered, more men will be employed, is as obvious as it sounds and contains no hidden snags that to set unemployed men to work on useful tasks does what it appears to do, namely, increases the national wealth, and that the notion that we shall, for, intri for intricate reasons, ruin ourselves financially if we use this means to increase our well-being is what it looks like, a bogey. End quote. Keynes, 1972. One can only hope that before the next Great Depression, 
the policy implications of modern money are understood.